Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome our online audiences and our later audiences that listen to this as a uh, video on our YouTube channel or our Facebook channel. So uh, today, uh, this is going to be, we've been doing this for almost exactly a year since uh, COVID shut down the Commonwealth Club. We're doing live stream interviews uh, with our authors that we usually bring to our uh, facilities in San Francisco for live audience uh, discussions about their books. Um, but fortunately, we can take in uh, authors from anywhere in the world at this point, uh, and we do. So we have today Fatima Sheikh, uh, who wrote the book Economy Hall. Um, it's about the Free Black Brotherhood in New Orleans uh, from the early 1800s all the way through uh, to the mid, uh, mid 20th century. And uh, I just think it's a great story, uh, Fatima, how you found, or not you, but your father found the ledgers for this uh, group and, and, and uh, recovered history. And then it sat there for a while, too. So why don't you tell that story first? Well, my father uh, found these books on the back of a dump truck. They were on their way to be thrown out in the trash. So mm -hmm. he took them. He found about 24 books. They were all in French and they were handwritten. And he found them in the trash and brought them home because he could read French. My mother could read French. And they thought that at some point they would get to it. Uh, but he, they didn't. He put them in the closet and they sat in the closet for about 50 years. Yeah. And, and, and yet it's the ledgers uh, from all of the meetings of this social club or, or, or almost like an insurance society, too. I think it could explain sort of the original function of it, too. Right. The, the Economy Society or the Societe d'Economy was, uh, was a benevolent association. So they took care of uh, insurance if someone uh, needed help uh, paying, for their, uh, paying for their rent while they were sick or if they died, they would pay the widows. And they also had a goal to help one another, to educate one another and to put a hand out to suffering humanity, which sort of grew as time went on. There were about 15 men that started in 1836 and, and hundreds men. joined. And um, this, we'll go back to the setting a little bit later um, and, and explain what it was like uh, for this group of men uh, in New Orleans in the 1830s, 40s and so on when they got started. Um, but I also like the story at the end. Uh, you, you went and interviewed a lot of people in your family once you started looking at these ledgers and trying to find out what the stories were, what could be uncovered. And you said you, you had a couple of aunts that you, you spoke to um, and that they ended up uh, passing away in Hurricane Katrina, of all things. You no. Know? Yes. Uh, well, yeah. the, these were um, I should say they, these are New Orleans aunts, right? Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't mean I'm related to them. <laughs> they're, they're my friends. Uh, they're my friends aunts. So uh, mm -hmm. there were there was a couple, uh, John Robichaud and his wife, who uh, who, who were the, the aunt and uncle of a friend of mine. And uh, I, this was really early on. I was just asking any of the older people that I knew, did they know anything about Economy Hall? And, and I mm -hmm. saw John Robichaud's name was sort of familiar as a musician. Uh, and my friend Deborah told me that that was her aunt and uncle. So I talked to them. Um, unfortunately, when uh, Katrina came, they uh, they drowned in their house, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't anywhere near the Ninth Ward, but the levees mm -hmm. broke and the water came in. And um, they had actually evacuated uh, for a storm previous to that. And they were really elderly. So they said, mm -hmm. well, you know, we evacuated before. They got stuck on the highway before. Uh, so they just stayed home that time. And, and uh, they passed during mm -hmm. Katrina. It was, yeah. it was a terrible time for a lot of people. Time for a terrible time for a lot of people. And, and it, it's a fascinating story you tell about this using this institution as a way to look at New Orleans society for 150, 160 years. And that the institution started as a social club, like you said, and ended up as, uh, you know, the Carnegie Hall of jazz music, uh, which is, I think, a, a really great story and why, of course, you, you spoke to musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you have a little video about uh, the background. So uh, why don't we uh, roll the video and then we'll get back to our discussion.
So I think it's uh, important to talk about the background. Um, some of the people that eventually ended up uh, founding the, the Economy Hall um, were from Haiti. Um, and that there was a lot of French um, culture that was part of it. it was mainly French. So why don't we get a, a, try to show people what it was like or to tell people what it was like in New Orleans at this time, because it was a very unusual society. By the way, um, when my European friends uh, all complain uh, about the European Union and say you know, that, that the European Union is going to homogenize our country, our, our, our things, we're not going to be French and Germans and Italians anymore. We're all going to be Europeans and everybody's going to be just like, like in America where everything is the same. <laughs> I always say, if you're worried about this, just go to New Orleans and then visit Chicago. <laughs> New Orleans has been part of America for 200 years. Chicago has been part of America for 200 years. Stop worrying about it. It's not going to happen. There's, there's no homogenization. So uh, anyway, uh, why don't we talk about New Orleans and its great uh, unusual history uh, and, and how French it was. Well, New Orleans, New Orleans, I don't think we'll ever be like Chicago. I think we're, we're a little too yeah. warm. For one thing, <laughs> yeah. um, emotionally or, or or just the weather, all, all, the, way, all the way around, all the way around. Um, the, in New Orleans, when uh, when this story starts, is a uh, is a is a French colony, uh, and the the Americans come in a little bit later, just a few li years later. But this because the story starts in Haiti, the um, the person who I who who I write the story about, or who's who, if it were a novel, it would be the main character. But he's a, he's a person who carries the story throughout. His parents came from Haiti, uh, and they came during the time of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, his his father may have been involved in the Haitian Revolution because it started in his town of Guadeloupe. So. And he was about 14 years old. They mm -hmm. came into New Orleans. They joined actually a, a culture that was already existing, a French culture, because there were many people who were the uh, who were the children of Frenchmen and Africans or mm -hmm. or who had come from the Caribbean much earlier. So there was already a French culture that they joined. So what you see in the economy hall when the economy hall begins are the children of Haitians and the children of Louisiana French who mm -hmm. are, who are already there. These 15 men that started it, and it's all men all the way throughout, uh, these 15 men were uh, traders, international traders. They were, uh, they were um, hairdressers. One was a hairdresser. Most of them were contractors or real estate people, and they mm -hmm. were able to operate like that in Louisiana because the laws allowed them to operate businesses, to, to do banking to a certain extent, uh, but not to uh, not to run for office, not to have suffrage. Uh, and they ha actually had to subvert their desires to white people. They could not think of themselves as equal to whites, which is a strange little thing to tell people how they should think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have tried that. Yeah. Um, it, it's pretty hard and it's very clear from from the ledgers and everything that the, the idea of telling them how to think uh, didn't work very well. No, um, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought one of the fascinating subtexts of this was, you know, uh, the fact that they were highly educated and and uh, effective and that they felt, you know, this is, you know, they, they had poor uh, white immigrants, for example, saying you're not as good as me, that kind of thing. And this, this, uh, of course, really graded. Um, there's a great story in, a Mark, in Mark Twain in, in uh, Huckleberry Finn, where uh, Huckleberry Finn's father, who was this extremely, uh, um, you know, not white trash, but, but you know, just not very educated and so on, so upset that there is a, a preacher comes to town who speaks really well from Illinois and, and it just annoys him that, that that person can vote in Illinois. Um, and he says, if, if he can vote in Illinois, I'm never voting again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, OK, that's OK. You know, that, that's probably helpful to everybody that you're not voting again. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so we have in this situation, very effective, productive people getting together and how their institution institution got started, how it evolved, their their pleasures, their successes, their failures the society completely crushing them at a certain point and it coming out with the music uh, as, as a way it's, it's a, such a nice arc to the story. So um, a painful arc, but still a great arc. So let's go to the 1830s, 1836 and, and uh, your main character uh, who helped to get this started or became one of the first secretaries and, and tell a little bit about the time and maybe a little bit of the, 
what what the society was like. I thought the statistics you gave were just fascinating about what the society was made of. So, well, the the society uh, was made up of free men of color. So let, let so we can understand this that mm-hmm. um, uh, people of color were uh, or blacks. We we call them blacks, and I call them blacks in this in this book. You know, I mean the the title mm-hmm. is the hidden history of a black brotherhood. Because in Haiti, that was the name that was used for all of their citizens, blacks, Mm -hmm. uh, because they did not want these uh, gradations of color that they thought was colonial that broke them up and and separated the people. Anyway, Mm -hmm. so these these free men of color uh, were about a third of the of a third of New Orleans. The enslaved were about another third and whites were were the last third. Right. If you put together all of the people of color, the enslaved and the free people of color, then you have about 66 percent of the city, which is Mm -hmm. of color, uh, which people tend to think that is why New Orleans is a little bit different. Uh, It's always also a little bit different because the free people, if you looked at the the uh, the number of blacks that were in the city, including free and enslaved, free people made up about 45 percent of the black population Mm -hmm. and they made up 45 percent of black the black population all the way up until the civil war, right? Until emancipation. So right. that, that, that number, that statistic that you're talking about, it compares to about 14% of free blacks in the United States. That's counting the now, North and the South at the time of the civil war. So mm-hmm. you figure half of the people were free in New Orleans in 1836, that's 30 years before the civil war. So they had really a strong society of, uh, society uh, in the generic term, right? Uh, The economy society itself was a strong society because the men had wealth and and property and that sort of thing. They were Mm -hmm. sort of the elites of this 45%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, with that, if 14% uh, was the number for the whole country at the time, then they must've been, this must've been a very strong concentration of free blacks. Were there any other cities where there was that kind of concentration of free uh, blacks or maybe I'm not I'm not sure about the history of it, like mm-hmm. the, the longevity of it, because I didn't study the longevity. But I mm-hmm. do know it in places like uh, Virginia, um, maybe around Charlotte, there were pockets of free blacks around the country. Uh, and if you look at Carter Woodson, I think Carter Woodson did a, a study uh, of free blacks, maybe in the 1920s, either the 1920s and the 1940s. But mm-hmm. you can see the statistics. Actually, you can find the names of all of the people who were free in mm-hmm. 1830s in that he, he took the census wow. and he went through and he looked, he found all of the free people in the United States in the 1830s, the 1830 census. So I was able to extrapolate from that to go to what was going on in New Orleans. Now, what he what he mentioned was that a lot of these people were free. Some of their relatives were enslaved, right? Mm-hmm. Their relatives were enslaved because maybe one person in the family would be able to purchase himself or herself. Mm-hmm. And then they might have their the rest of their family. They may not have enough money to purchase the rest of their family. So mm-hmm. you find these families are um, they're close. If you read um, The Known World, you, did you read The, the, the Known World? Um, no. I can't think of the author right now. But he yeah. wrote about a situation where people were free and enslaved and they all knew each other. Yeah, it sounds uh, similar, although it's all in one city. It sounds similar to when somebody uh, comes to the United States, immigrates here, and, and then uh, brings their family one at a time as they can afford to bring them over and get them approved and so on and so forth. Right, right. It. The situation is they're all in one place. And you figure in, in, in New Orleans in particular, it was owned by the French and the Spanish before the United States, right? So during the French, mm-hmm. I mean, during the Spanish period, uh, manumission was much easier. So mm-hmm. they were able uh, they were able to buy themselves. People were able to buy themselves and to buy their families a lot easier. Mm-hmm. And after uh, the U.S. came, the rules got a little bit harder. It became harder to purchase yourself. Mm-hmm. Self-purchase became harder, if impossible, maybe impossible. Uh, and it also became harder to become to f- have someone free you because uh, they had to go to court at a certain point. They had to prove certain things. And then mm-hmm. as time went on, as the Civil War approached, you had to put a bond bond of thousands of dollars. So you had to uh, free them, put up thousands of dollars, and they had to leave the state. It was fascinating in your book uh, to show how the rules kept getting worse and worse as you got closer and closer to the Civil War. Um, right. and, and why don't you explain what the fear was? I mean, it was obviously that that was a fear on the whites uh, part, that, that free blacks would, would ruin the situation. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people aren't aware of how 
uh, slavery was one of the defining political issues of the entire period from 1800 till the Civil War, you know, in, in the United States, always, always in the background and then many times in the foreground as well. Um, and that that influenced this, this group in, in uh, New Orleans, um, not, not because they were the focus, but because the focus was let's keep slavery to the extent we can. Sure. Well, well, slavery, of course, was the economic engine of the United States and in, in much of the world. Right. American slavery mm -hmm. and American cotton uh, was was a, an economic engine here. So it helped it helped with uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution in, in a certain well, for industries, northern industries. Right. They got the raw mm -hmm. materials. Um, and New Orleans was pivotal to that because it was an entry from Europe through the Gulf and it was an entry into the interior of the United States through the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, People were afraid uh, that what would happen in Louisiana and the rest of the South w was the same that happened in Haiti, that mm -hmm. people who were slightly privileged, the, the free people of color, would align with the slaves. And now we already know that their population is larger than the white population for a good while up until the you know, 1850s or so. So they're mm -hmm. afraid that these people will get together, basically, and overthrow the South. So, so that is the that is, and if you if you see well, when, as you read the book, you probably saw that Haiti was sort of villainized all the way through, right? right? Yeah. Once once they you know once they had freed, then they of course they were attempted to be undercut, and they had their own problems and everything. And uh, so uh, it, it was interesting, even for this group. Uh, it's just a side thing, but you you had them during this period of time wondering whether they should move to Veracruz, Mexico. Um, you know, as a as a group, uh, the, the free blacks should move out there. Uh, that didn't come to fruition. So, you know, we can see, but it, it's an interesting insight into what they were dreaming about and how terrible the situation was. Factual thing w w was also interesting uh, about the economy being so strong in New Orleans that the banks uh, had more capital in New Orleans than they had in New York City at this time. Only Pennsylvania uh, was a richer state. Um, I found that fascinating. New York hadn't gotten to its current status, obviously, but still. Uh, it was fascinating to me, too, to find that out. That was in the 1830s, I believe, that there yeah, was more yeah. gold in the banks in New Orleans than there was gold uh, backing the banks in, in New York. And, mm -hmm. and that was because so many people were coming south to invest in plantations and in, mm -hmm. in all of the industries that go along with plantations. Right. The the. Um, the machinery, the clothing, the, you know, the, the food, I mean, everything that went on with it, the banks mm -hmm. were, the banks were making loans and, and uh, supporting this. Right. So we, so it was a, it was a really prosperous time in the 1830s and 1840s in New Orleans. Yeah. So we have this group that gets started and they're kind of this club to, to get started. Why don't you give a little flavor of some of the entries um, that you were, you, you know, you're, you told the story based on the entries in these journals, which I thought was very fascinating. Um, but the, you just a couple of the stories that you find from the 1830s and 40s at the beginning. Well, let me let me think. There were so many that were that were fascinating to me. Um, in the very beginning, they um, for one thing, at one meeting, they asked for everybody to put up uh, uh, twenty five dollars for membership. That was, you know, and it, it seemed to me that twenty five dollars it was piastres is what they called it um, was a lot for somebody to be just carrying around, you know, at that time. Right. So in the 1830s. So they all had the twenty five dollars. They also. Um, uh, wanted to create a sign mysterious, right? They wanted to have a, a, a secret sign, which they never wrote down in the journal. So I was dying to find out what that secret sign was. <laughs> <laughs> but they decided to, to create a secret sign that they never told me, um, mm. but that so that when they would encounter anyone from the society on the street, I guess they'd give the little hand signal, right? Right, um, right. So, so that was some of it. And, and then by 1838, uh, which really surprised me, was that they had a big ceremony to uh, get a, a portrait of Pétion. And Pétion was the uh, president of the First Republic of Haiti. Now, mm -hmm. Pétion's um, portrait was uh, painted by an artist who they didn't name, but the artist was paid by Charles Laveau. Charles Laveau was the father of Marie Laveau, and if you know anything about New Orleans, Marie Laveau was the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Yeah. So the, the fact that these circles were so tight that these mm -hmm. people all knew each other, it, it just gave me more to, you know, more treasure to, to look into. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, like you said, you had, they, they cherished this portrait of, of the president of Haiti um, the way 
the way some Russian, uh, you know, emigrants would keep a picture of the czar in their home, that kind of thing. <laughs> very, very uh, interesting similarities of what you keep when you, when you are uh, moved out of where your location is and you want to hold on to one piece of it, right? Well, they, they held on to Pétion and they held on to Pétion's ideas, if, if you recall, because the, right. the, um, the, by the time after the Civil War, when we were to, when Reconstruction came along, they were still trying to enact some of the things that Pétion uh, tried to enact, which was to give uh, the enslaved portions of the land that they had worked on as small farms, which mm -hmm. is what Pétion did in Haiti wasn't really a successful uh, plan in Haiti, you know, because mm -hmm. of the international commerce involved, but that's what they tried to do in New Orleans. It, it wasn't very successful in New Orleans either because the plantation people um, didn't want it and, and push back on it. But that was their idea to use some of the ideas that had gone on in Haiti to, mm -hmm. to implement reconstruction in, in Louisiana. Yeah. It, uh, we'll, we'll get to the reconstruction um, elements because I, I find that a very fascinating period of time because it only only lasted 11 years after the Civil War. Basically, right. um, this whole war was fought uh, for at least for the sake of the Union. Yes, that was part of it, but also to free the slaves. And yet that whole project was given up not or, or let let go just 11 years later. Yeah. And the irony was that the Republican used it. Uh, I mean, the, the Abraham Lincoln's party, uh, Hayes, Ruth Ford Hayes, used that in order to win the election by promising that Reconstruction would come to an end. Do you, do you, ha do you know that story uh, about that election? Because it, it certainly. Well, that was the time that is when the time the federal troops left, left New Orleans and left the South. Right. Right. When they made the Democrats made. Um, the Democrats made an agreement so that uh, they would get uh, Ruth Ford Hayes would get their electoral votes if they would if if he would pull the federal troops out of the South. And that was basically the end of Reconstruction. But it, it was it was really shocking to me that Reconstruction was only given that that small window to work, you know. Right. Um, and that the um, and that the Freedmen's uh, Bureau lasted didn't even last that long, the, you mm. know. Another thing that was really surprising to me was that the Freedmen's Bureau, even though they were telling people that uh, you can stay and work the land and you can earn money by working the land, you'll get money from um, from your former owners, which is kind of difficult to conceive of. But but if yeah. you work the if you work that land, they'll pay you and then you can save your money and get something else. Right. However, the Freedmen's Bureau wasn't providing them with seeds or tools. They were, right. they were they were Freedmen's Aids Association, uh, of which uh, Luja Bogiel, who is the character in my book, um, or the actual person in my book, um, the Freedmen's Aid uh, Societies around the country and, and one in New Orleans were created so that they could raise money to give these people seeds and tools to work on the land. Otherwise, yeah. they're renting the tools and that is also going into their profits. And so right. which, which, which we saw when when we saw sharecropping come up for the next Right. Exactly. Years, whatever, you, right. Yeah. You just you, you go to, back to something that's almost like slavery. Um, yeah, right. And, and uh, that that was the, the the goal, the aim, the success of the white supremacists. If right. we can't have slavery, we're going to get something as close to it as possible. That's um, right. And as you said, uh, the Democrats, the Southern Democrats are the ones who agreed with the Republicans to turn this over. So they went against their own Democratic candidate who had won the election um, right. because they got the Republicans who were the party that had fought the Civil War, you know, in order to free the slaves. So the, the ironies and, and the, the, the stupidity uh, seems pretty amazing. Uh, uh, it's amazing. And it's also sort of par for the course. Right. Right. Um, right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's there was, the unfortunate there was part no of it. Punishment. Yeah. There was no punishment for the other than having the, the vote taken away for a little while from the former rebels. But there was no. Um, uh, there were no real repercussions for having fought the Civil War. You know, I mean, uh, that that the same people were allowed to get back in and to run things. And they ran things as close as they could to slave society again. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, let's talk about a little bit about the family life of this group, because, as you said, they kind of all knew each other and they were all interconnected and they lived in nice homes in a particular area. And, and also tell a little bit about the names of the streets. I, I just thought that was another fascinating they had this section of town. They had such great names for their streets and made sure that they intersected, uh, you know, in ways. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was just lucky that the streets intersected in the way that they did. Um, <laughs> the, uh, 
uh, it, it's in the Faubourg Marigny that the streets are named really colorfully. And and the uh, in the Faubourg Marigny, the, 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 the corner where they met for the first time, the house of Charles Laveau sat at the intersection of Grand Homme et Histoire. So great men in history. Is yes. where the where the first meeting was held. So when I saw that, I said, "Oh, I have to write this. I have to. Write this. <laughs> <laughs> How can I let this go?" <laughs> yeah, and the fact that he, that I'm sure he he maybe named the street so that his his uh, house was right there on that intersection. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it wasn't Marigny. It was it was Laveau that lived there. But uh, the uh, and the Duparts was interesting. So Charles Laveau lived there. He died. And the person who um, who lived there afterward was a was a Dupart, a Charles Dupart. And that mm. Dupart name uh, came into New Orleans in 1718. And mm. it was there in New Orleans, still in that same location or, or either in that house or right nearby all the way into the 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that was another problem. How many different families there were that are the New Orleans families? You know, it's like, is there, is there a society? Is there a group of people who, you know, can trace their New Orleans roots back to the 1700s or something like that? Well, there are uh, a lot the, of people. Like the daughters of the American revolution sort of thing. There, there are a lot of people who are trying. I'm actually in a group called La Creole. And uh -huh. uh, several of the people there can trace their pe their families back to the 1700s. They 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 trace them back, uh, and and I'm just talking about the people, uh, the enslaved and and people of color. They they take some of them even go further back if the if you go down the European line, you know, in right. France. But but a lot of them have traced back into the 1700s. Uh, we have a newsletter if anybody's interested in La Creole, just you know look us up online. But uh, they're genealogists and they and they look for their families. Uh, explain the use of the word Creole, because uh, that's that's another part of your book that was fascinating. People arguing over the use of the of the word and who, who qualifies to use it or not. Right. Right. Well, I guess I guess we've all heard of New Orleans as a Creole city. Right. right. So everybody, everybody says, oh, New Orleans, the Creole city. Well, the Creole means something different to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. But what it meant was. Um, what it meant initially was people who were born in the United States who were non-indigenous. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the French that would have children in Louisiana, they would be Creole. The, the I include the Africans who came into Louisiana and had children, Creole. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who were mixed, who mixed from the people who came into Louisiana, all the non-indigenous people uh, that came in during the colonial period and their descendants. Right. But as time went on, that that. Um, that name Creole became very important right? because people mm -hmm. came to New Orleans because it had a Creole flavor. Well, that, that Creole flavor was created by these, the mix of the African and the French and the Spanish and, and, and the Native Americans, the people who had come there and sort of, uh, I think for survival's sake, sort of combined their cultures. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was largely French speaking, but they and they had a little bit of uh, a little bit of the culture from all of these other nations. So you had uh, it was French speaking, but you had gumbo, you know, uh, 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 like okra gumbo, which comes from Africa. You had you had mm -hmm. a lot of mix. Anyway, as this time went on and white supremacy rose after the Civil War, uh, white started saying that uh, Creole means white. So yeah. as, as you read in the book, there was something right at the turn of the 20th century that where the newspaper defined it as uh, so many good things are Creole, Creole tomatoes, you know, uh, Creole uh, coffee. Um, but Creole actually means white. It does not mean Negro. So. Yeah. It's like saying that jazz is white, you know. So. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think yeah. a few people may have claimed that along the way. I'm sure they have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Kind of hard to spread, but there are people who think that the earth is still flat. So right. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> reality doesn't have to get in the way. No, um, not at all. <laughs> so um, let's let's go to the Civil War time, because there was a lot of pressure. It was obvious to a lot of politicians and a lot of thinkers that the 1850s was leading to a really big problem because the compromises with the states has expanded out. Um, the Southerners were obviously concerned because the population in the free areas was growing greater and greater. Uh, what some people aren't aware from American history is that the South and the North were, were very equally uh, split in terms of population from the time of the revolution on. Um, and that's why there was a balance between the two and you really couldn't uh, go one way or the other. Um, but 
as time progressed and, and the immigration uh, took place from Europe and everything, the, the split started to go in the other direction. And there were some Southern uh, groups that were trying to get Haiti and Cuba and all that uh, and Puerto Rico all to be part of the United States so that they could have more slave states. Um, that obviously didn't happen. But Mexico, uh, Mexico uh, the part of your book that I found interesting, I hadn't heard that angle before, was that taking Texas away from Mexico was a way to ex- expand the land uh, for slavery. Well, you know, yeah, in, in a way. Well, Mexico, you, you, there, there was no slavery in Mexico. So, right. so many of the people you, you talked a little bit uh, a few minutes ago about how this group wanted to move to Mexico, even right. though they didn't move as a group, several members went individually mm-hmm. and some members for, uh, and some people from the rural areas of Louisiana went to Mexico and settled in Mexico. So um, I actually know a woman who has traced the families that went to Mexico and has found some of their descendants that are still there. Huh. Uh, yeah. So so, um, yeah, they, they were trying to what happened when when um, when we we're getting close to a civil war, people did not want free people in the United States. Basically, they, they were uh, they were invited to leave in many ways. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, uh, colonial I can't think of it. The, the, the American society. colonials. Yes, right. They were bringing people to Africa because they were said, well, you can, we are happy that you're free. We think that freedom is the right thing for you. Just don't be free over here, you know. Right. So, <laughs> so they, they were taking people back to Africa. Men like the people in the economy society were saying, well, well, really, we don't want to go back to Africa. We have businesses here. We've never been mm-hmm. to Africa. We, we have businesses. We have children. We have extended family. Why should we leave? And we were mm-hmm. already free. Right. right. So um, they were uh, they they were encouraged not to stay, but they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there were laws around the country, like in Oregon, where uh, people free people were not allowed to enter. There were lots of states that were putting up laws that they said, uh, we mm-hmm. don't want free people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the bluntness of it is kind of amazing uh, of the laws. And, and since it's so, so much against what what the constitution and, and the declaration of independence was about it just it seems to be ignored. It doesn't seem to be too difficult to ignore either. Almost. Um, well, you know, the constitution sort of um, serves as, with interpretation, with interpretation, right? Everybody sort of interprets the constitution. Right. They'd, they'd like to interpret it. <laughs> so uh, as the pressures grew on the society, it was interesting how, they reacted to the Civil War. Some, some joined the Confederate Army first and then switched to the Union Army when they came. Why don't you explain what was going on? It's a, it, I think it's a very good example of understanding a, a group who's influential in a society, but they're not accepted in society. So they have to switch with whoever is in power and, and, and they, they, just, they make their moves based upon protecting their group of people. Right, exactly. We have lots of experiences like that in history. And, yeah. and some that, people don't understand that, them, but it, it's, it's really or, or think they're traitors or they're not consistent, but they're really they're consistent about protecting their group, basically. That is where they're consistent. That was a good explanation because they they yeah. they they understood that um, the Civil War was about to begin. They were told that northern invaders were coming that, mm-hmm. you know, who they didn't know. Um, and they um, they had a chance to arm themselves. So they joined Confederate militias. They never really joined the army. I don't think they were they were in mm-hmm. militias who who could protect the uh, New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Um, what happened was when the when the Union Army actually did come in, the rebel army left and these people were uh protecting the city. The, the free people of color were still protecting the city. Uh, mm-hmm. And they were basically protecting their homes and their families. You know, I, I, I mm-hmm. told somebody the other day, you know, if somebody told you um, that people were coming in and you can have a gun and you can protect your home or you can become an enemy of the people you live around and not have any weapon, you know, you mm-hmm. would choose to have the weapon and stay home. Right. Right. You know? So uh, this is what these people did. And, and as I explained it in the book, the, the, these were also the children of the Haitian revolutionaries, lots of them. They knew the history of and they, they, they were friends with come on forward in, in Mexico. So they knew how these sort of things went, you know, that, that uh, one side would be on top at one time, another side would be on top at another time. And neither one of them really may have your interests at heart. 
So yeah. The, yeah. The, the best thing that they could do was join the Confederate militia. And then after the Confederate militia uh, and after the Confederates left New Orleans, uh, they joined the Union Army. And they mm-hmm. became uh, soldiers in the Uni- Union Army. It's some of the first officers in the United States, actually, uh, because it, that it, is it was interesting. It is really lay. Yeah, it was interesting. One of the one of the members uh, w- with who spoke French and English extremely well, obviously, uh, he acted as a translator for the Union Army, or or was able to 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 uh, you know give them the information on both sides. Right. Right. Uh, I, that's a good way to prove that you're educated. <laughs> well, that was Charles Charles Sauvignet, I think. I think he was yeah. one of the few black officers um, from that group, at least, that that went in with the Union Army and stayed the whole time. Because what these officers found out was that when they joined the Union Army, even though their their values actually were more aligned, were, were aligned with the Union, um, that uh, that they found out that the Union Army was just about as racist as the Confederates they lived around. The, right. Their soldiers were not going to listen to them. Uh, they were not going to get promoted. They were treated badly. You know, so so a lot of them quit the Union Army after they got in the Union Army. But Sovinet was one of the ones who stayed all the way through. You mentioned the American Colonial Society, uh, you know, wanting the blacks to, to move to Liberia, Liberia, trying to set that up. Um, and, and that was founded by a couple of our early presidents. Right. Uh, um, or they were among the earlier ones uh, that, that got on board. And I think a lot of people don't realize how um, so many people who were fighting for the end to slavery from the North, uh, their hope was that everybody was going to go to Liberia because they didn't, they were just as racist as the South, but they didn't have any economic, uh, you know, interest in the situation. Right. Right. They didn't um, have an immediate economic interest, let's say. They, right. They no immediate right economic interest. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, when the French got rid of the Huguenots, the, they, they, they thought they had no immediate uh, economic interest either. And it ruined their economy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, well, it was people. it was, you know, it was convenient that that um, that the country would become a, a white country, you know, that that mm-hmm. they wouldn't have this race problem. They wouldn't have this color problem anymore if everybody just left and went to library. You know, so um, um, while you're saying that, I, I just was thinking of the other story that you told about the Sicilians also being lynched. This was the end of the century. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to get back to that because I thought that was an interesting part of the process as it, it as it got worse and worse and worse and worse. They, their their issue of white supremacy became more and more tightly defined mm-hmm. um, and, and more violent, the more tightly defined yeah. they got it. So um, we're talking about uh, the Civil War era and they're finished with the Civil War. And now is the time of hope. And and uh, not immediately. It took a while. Um, but soon they began to think they might maybe they're going to get their way. So why don't you tell the story of their hopes expanding and the election of even as a lieutenant governor of, of uh, someone that they knew and so on and so forth. So there was a lot of progress over that 10, 11 year period. Let's talk about that before we go back to the depression stuff. Right, right. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, 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 well, when the Union Army was there, um, uh, Louisiana and New Orleans, particularly, was turned into a territory, a federal territory, and mm-hmm. um, and men in Economy Hall were about six or seven hundred men that came to Economy Hall to talk about getting the vote. There was a meeting held and they they wanted to petition. They decided to create a petition and write to Lincoln, to Abraham Lincoln, to say, well, we should have the vote because. Uh, this we have no more state. We don't, we don't have a state of Louisiana anymore. Mm-hmm. Louisiana is a territory, so we can recreate the state in any way we want. So we should recreate the state uh, with black suffrage. And they meant suffrage for themselves and for the formerly enslaved. This was in 1863. So this was actually mm-hmm. even before the end of the Civil War. Uh, there was a there's a beautiful passage in the book where uh, Francois Boisdoré speaks and he says that um, he says all of the men here are literate. All of the men here can sign their names. We're not mm-hmm. like the immigrants who come in. He didn't say immigrants. He said we're not like the Irish who come in and mm-hmm. can't don't know how to sign their names. He said we're all literate. They mm-hmm. actually sa- sent a petition of a thousand free men of color who were property owners to Lincoln to get suffrage, uh, which they did not get for a little while. Uh, it, it was interesting that they mentioned to, you know, their military service, both, uh, you know, during that time, but also they went back to the Battle of New Orleans, which is one of these very interesting parts of the War of uh, 1812. It happened after the, the, the war was actually over, but still was a very big battle. When, when they were, and they were very proud of having taken part in it. They took they had a uh, influential part in the battle. So 
mind you. That that was it was interesting how they sold themselves. The 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 veteran society. Well, well, Bois de Ray, the the fellow who spoke at the at the meeting, was the son of someone of of Francois Bois de Ray's père, the father, who had mm-hmm. fought in the Battle of New Orleans, and and actually. The Society of Veterans used to meet in Economy Hall. They met uh, maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks in Economy mm-hmm. Hall. And these were the survivors from the Battle of New Orleans. These men had joined uh, with Andrew Jackson when he called for help to, to win the Battle of New Orleans. Um, mm-hmm. He said that every man who joined, every free man of color would get the same uh, amount of money as any white man. And they would also get land. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was reneged upon, right? That, that, <laughs> right? Uh, they did. They did around the time of the Civil War. I think. I think it was around the time of the Civil War. Might have been a while. Might have been the eighteen seventies. They did start petitioning the government for the money that they were owed, and some people did get some, a pension from the, mm-hmm. from the war. But um, Jackson did say, and there's a uh, in the archives at Princeton. There's a letter uh, from Jackson. Uh, with the uh, the names of the men who had fought in the in the Battle of New Orleans. And mm-hmm. he did say in one account that I have in my book um, that he thought that the battle was won uh, when they shot Parkingham. And he it, he thought that the bullet came from a free man of color. So yeah. they were very proud of having what they thought won the, the Battle of New Orleans. And they were um, and and one of the uh, free men of color, uh, uh, Charles Savory, his son died in the battle. And mm-hmm. because his son had raised a company of men to fight in the Battle of New Orleans, he was given a pension right very early on. Mm-hmm. Now, I just thought of something in your book uh, as a slight aside, but still, mm-hmm. um, you you talk a lot about the parades that they start. Now, uh, for those who aren't familiar with New Orleans culture, there, there's a, a thing about parades with bands, marching bands and everything for all kinds of different events in New Orleans. And uh, you're, you're, you're basically saying that it got started or almost got started, maybe, or whatever, or at least certainly was, was uh, pushed by this group at the Economy Hall. So why don't you tell a little bit, because that just kept growing and growing until you had the jazz bands, right? right. Well, well, it's huge. Um, they, they started, uh, well, it's the one documentation that I have. I have documentation of when it started. And mm. they started because... Um, after Reconstruction, there was a pushback from white supremacists and the men in the economy decided that they were not going to be afraid of uh, white supremacists, even though they were creating violence all around them. Um, and uh, so they decided that they were going to march with an American flag and a brass band and they mm-hmm. were going to march through the streets for every event that they had. So if they were going to a picnic, they were going to march with the flag and the, and the band. If they're going to have a funeral, they were gonna, well, they were going to have a I don't know if they had the flags at the funerals, but they definitely had the bands after that. Right. So all of their outings would be with the with the band. Now, I do believe it grew a lot from the Economy Society mm-hmm. because the Economy Society was one of the first uh, benevolent societies of free men or, or men of color in New Orleans mm-hmm. by starting in 1836. And most of the other societies that are marching, some that are still marching now, started after the civil war. So I think it was one of the ones that pushed it. Pushed the idea. So yeah. that, that, that's one of the big influences on culture. We'll, we'll get to jazz later on. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, this, this group of men and what they can accomplish, it's very interesting because uh, you know they didn't accomplish a lot of things they wanted to, but they still had a big influence on, on their society. Well, for a good while, if you, you think about it, the, the radical Republicans and, and the economy was right in there with them uh, because mm-hmm. the, the Republican Party of Louisiana was started in Economy Hall. It mm-hmm. came out of a group, the uh, Friends of Universal Suffrage and some of the radicals who were in Economy Hall and with the mm-hmm. uh, Lu- Tribune, Louisiana Tribune, uh, joined together to create the Louisiana Republican Party. And the mm-hmm. radical Republican Party was the party of Lincoln, but also the party that pushed for uh, universal suffrage, black suffrage. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1868, when everybody got into the legislature, they created a constitution that was mm-hmm. uh, more broad than any other state. It had um, suffrage, citizenship to anybody who was in the, the state at the time. And they also had free public integrated education, which mm-hmm. is uh, which went further than the United States Constitution when they when they added the articles, 13, 14, 15th Amendments. 
and the integrated uh, education system uh, there probably was the, the first uh, real one. And then it, it disappeared uh, later on in the 1880s, 1890s, when it was pushed back. Um, I think, in fact, you, you said, if I remember now the detail, that after re Reconstruction was uh, shut down in, the, in that election in 1876, that there was a new superintendent of schools that was elected, and he's the one who instituted segregation in the schools again and, and, and disallowed the schools that were already segregated. Right, right. He disallowed, they, they went back to segregation. And the reason that the school board went back to segregation and this was allowed to happen is you have to realize that that very, at the end of Reconstruction, uh, white supremacists were enforcing the law through murder or were, were, right. were, I'm sorry, resisting the law through murder. So what they were doing was all of these black people who had gotten suffrage were now being murdered and fired upon and, and they're getting, you know, their houses burned, all sorts of things uh, for exercising the vote. So what happened, what people were not, uh, people stopped voting. You know, they said, well, if sure. I'm going to vote and I'm going to, my, my life is threatened, I'm just not going to vote. So you saw a lot of black people staying away from the polls. Mm -hmm. if they stayed away from the polls and they lost the vote. Then the white supremacist government was able to come back in. And when they came mm -hmm. back in, they changed all of these laws. Yeah, some of the statistics you gave were, were um, again, depressing, but amazing. One average of one person per, I think, every other day or something like that being killed for several years in a row. Uh, yes, it was. It was. It's Ida B. Wells, Wells report on lynching. And it uh -huh. was uh, it was at least one a day. It was about twelve hundred, I thought, one year. So uh -huh. which makes it more than one a day. Um, right. it, it might be one a day right now. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Might be one a day right now. But I think it might have been about three a day or four a day back in that period, that period mm -hmm. from 1882 to the 1890s. I think it was that she did this report. Yeah. And I think people, uh, you know, during that 11 year period, um, give an idea about how many people uh, of color were elected, not just even in Louisiana, but across the South. Um, uh, Louisiana seems to have done the most. There was a lot of people elected um, when the vote was achieved and, and utilized. Right, right. Many people were, they, you know, the Reconstruction governments, I think the Reconstruction has sort of been pictured in, in America uh, as something that was like a mistake. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, when we hear, heard about it in school, we heard that it was a lot of incapable blacks and a lot of carpetbaggers and scallywags. Right. right. And, and actually, when I was researching this book, because because I had the minutes, but the minutes of the meetings in the journals just talked about what was going on in the economy society. And I had to put that into context of American history. Right. So mm -hmm. I saw that the people who were being elected were not um, fools. They were not people who didn't have literacy and didn't know how to use the vote. These were educated people. And I think if you look across the South, you'll see that the people who were who were voted in in many places across the South were people who had some education, maybe had some property, but they were certainly capable of handling the vote. So mm -hmm. um, it's a, I'm trying to give you a picture of Reconstruction that, that sort of, um, that changes what people have been taught to believe. These were not incapable people who went in. These were people who were murdered after they had been duly elected. Right. And, and I think uh, when any activist uh, trying to create a, a real egalitarian society nowadays, so on, looks back and they say, well, you know, they didn't do this or they didn't do that. But they, that I think shows that they were educated uh, people trying to compromise. What, what can we achieve? What can we not achieve? They were in a situation that they knew was very delicate. And, and uh, you, you may disagree with some of their choices as to where they should compromise. But right. the idea that they compromised, I mean, it, 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 they would have been idiots if they hadn't done something to achieve it. Um, it Along that line, um, you mentioned this is a little, lot later, but mm -hmm. you mentioned Booker T. Washington and, and, and probably after so many decades of, of, of failure, um, accepting uh, segregation because he maybe gave up on social equality, but was hoping for education and financial improvement of his people. So why don't you jump, because that's, he's considered a compromiser, um, and, uh, but he's obviously very well educated. That's a tough choice to make, um, but, but, uh, it seemed like it was at least somewhat effective. It, it's it's still under debate, I think, right now. Right. Oh, um, oh. It, it's, it's debated it's, forever. Yeah. yeah what can you accomplish? For, yeah. 
the, the, the men of the economy society who were the elites of the society, right, of, right. of, of Louisiana, um, they decided what they did during Reconstruction is they went, they got offices, uh, political offices. They also pushed in the courts to get um, to have equal accommodations in restaurants, in the opera houses, on the mm-hmm. on the uh, railroads. Uh, and they were when white supremacy came in, it was starting to lose these battles. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and these battles were being lost. There were other people tr- doing the same thing across the South, other blacks across the South that were trying to do this through the courts. Mm-hmm. They were losing. When Booker T. Washington came in, he said, well, um, he said the uh, the opportunity to have a job is more important than the opportunity to sit in an opera house. And that mm-hmm. was it was sort of a direct slap at these kinds of people. Right. Because right. He said, his idea was that, well, here you can sit in the opera house, but some of these people don't even have enough money to sit in the opera house because they don't have jobs. They can. So mm-hmm. he made the compromises with white Southerners, white Southerners that he knew were were uh, going to continue segregation. He made mm-hmm. this compromise. We'll accept segregation as long as you provide us with the A&M schools, as long as you provide us with education and mm-hmm. you will provide us with jobs. Well, I don't think the jobs thing came through very well, but the yeah. HBCUs was started. A lot of the um, the black institutions of higher, higher learning were started. Right. And um, there there was the in Louisiana, the discussion was between a fellow uh, in Rudolph de Dunes, uh, Our People and Our History. He talks about that. He mm-hmm. says that people were willing to um, accept that segregation. Even their friends were willing to accept that segregation in exchange for their equality. So um, uh, he, he was very disappointed that the, the movement toward equality wasn't uh, um, didn't persist, but it mm-hmm. didn't persist because this was the exchange that was made. Well, it's also I mean, he did it in the context of 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 what had been achieved being taken away piece by piece by piece over the last 20 years. And in, in a way, he was trying to arrest that, uh, that mo- moment uh, of, of um, decrease. Right. But it, it reminds me a little bit of, I mean, in China today, people are saying, I mean, I lived in Hong Kong for a while, mm-hmm. you know, back in the seventies. And then of course, Hong Kong is now being pushed down. And at the same time, there's been economic freedom in the country right. that has changed the lives of, of hundreds of millions of people. Uh, for the better from an economic point of view, but the freedom uh, is the political freedom doesn't seem to be on the horizon at all. Um, and I think people, so it, where do you those compromise? are very tough decisions to make yeah. politically. Yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a very tough decision. Do you, are you, are you going to make the economics uh, better for, for more people or are mm-hmm. you going to have this uh, freedom and this freedom of expression and this freedom? Now, I'm not sure that it is always, something it's i'm not sure that it's always an either or actually right and that's why i think it's a false choice you know um and i think that this uh i don't think you have to make those kind of choices really Mm -hmm. i think that people can have uh freedom and can find um jobs at the same time yeah well yeah obviously that's the ideal um and and uh one of the nice things about um personal freedom uh, i mean at least uh, thinking freedom is that we always have that. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody can take that away. I mean, people have tried under certain totalitarian regimes right. to take away your thinking freedom. Um, and it works for some people by intimidation, but in, but you, you can always think uh, your, your, your thoughts. Um, it's, it's, and, and many times it's nice that we, right. even that can't be taken away, but that's not really exactly what we want in society is just to be able to think freely and keep it to ourselves. No, no, we want to write and think about all of the people who have written. I mean, that 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 write under duress. Right. Know? And and during the time when we were talking about the 1830s before in the 1830s, it was against the law for blacks to read and write. Right. Anybody right. who was enslaved, they, they, it was against the law to read or write. Um, the, the economy men built a library at that time. They had mm-hmm. a library in there. So, you know, they were not supposed to think of themselves as equal, but they certainly had a library and they, they certainly had thoughts of equality. And then they wrote these journals that stayed for 100 years. So, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think you can keep people's ideas down. Basically. No, down. And uh, what's what's great about that that history and the difficult time that they had was that we have the 20th century now and it, it's often been said going back to ancient times you know mm-hmm. don't educate the slaves don't educate the women don't educate anybody that might take over for us right, um, right. 
Uh, but the 20th century has proved that everybody can be educated. That, that, you know, and, and there may be people in the future who, again, argue, you know, don't educate, don't educate. But it'll be like the flat earth society. That's the way I look at it. It, well, I, I gonna, would like I would like to believe that. I think there are people right now who would like to deny education and would yeah. like to deny voter rights. Right. I mean, that's yeah, exactly. Oh, there you know. definitely are. Yeah. I'm hoping and I expect it because they don't they have fewer and fewer facts on their side. You yeah. know, if you can if you can point to a lot of people and say, see how how unintelligent they are. Well, they have been kept away from education. They have been enslaved. They have their spirit has been pushed down. That has nothing to do with the fact that they can be educated or not educated, but it's at least a piece of evidence. Now we have a whole 20th century with hundreds of millions of people around the world of every sex and every race getting highly educated. And one of the statistics that you showed in your book that only 15% of the people were literate uh, in New Orleans at, 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 in the 1830s, 1840s, I think something like that. I thought that was very, uh, also I think that might have been a the, world. I think that statistic was around the world. I think around the world, percent right, of right. the people around the world were literate. And these these guys were among them. Yeah, exactly. And and so that was that was fascinating because you, I knew that the statistics were a lot less. But to go to 15 percent just 150 years later, I mean, what's the what's the literacy rate now for, for the whole world? It must be at least 70 or 80 percent, I would think. I would um, think I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's yeah. pretty high. I think it's pretty high. I think around the around the turn of the century, it was very high. Yeah. Yeah. So we've 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 proven that that's wrong. All those ideas are wrong. And, and we can always accept that something and not accept. But we can always uh, look forward to the future in, in, in a negative way and say, yes, there will always be some groups who will argue that this is. But the facts are, are, are stacked against them. Um, just like, you know, somebody can say. Uh, the pictures have been faked about the moon landing and the earth is really flat. It, it's not very convincing to very many people. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I tend to think it's human nature, which was what was really fun about about writing this book was that mm -hmm. I could write about human beings in in, mm -hmm. in in history. You know, I didn't have to just write a factual history book. I, I could write about right. human beings. And, and what I've seemed to find, what I think I found out about human beings is that there's always the, these forces that are at odds, right? There's always an authoritarian force and there's a force, a democratic force, a right. force that wants everybody to be equal. And there's always a, a, a force that says, well, no, some people are smarter than others. Right? And, then, <laughs> and that's me. It's always, <laughs> and it's it's me, always right? me. It's never, it's never the other guys that are smarter. <laughs> right, right. And it's always me. So I have to tell you what to do, right? So that, yeah, exactly. that push and pull, it, it goes on through centuries, you know? I mean, it's always going on, you know? So, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, unfortunately, the, one of the sadder parts of your story was that, that the men who worked for this for so long in the, eight, in the 1880s and 90s, so many of them committed suicide. They despaired so much as, it, as everything was being pulled apart that they had worked on. Um, that's a sad part of the story. Very interesting to read. We have a few minutes left. I want you to talk about the building as a building, as it went down in, from the society and then became a music center and a, a place for parties. They rented it out as their society uh, decreased in influence. Uh, and that eventually, like, for example, I think you said that Louis Armstrong had his first you know, uh, debut there in public. So right. why, don't, why don't you tell that story? Because that's also fascinating. Yeah. Well, after after when white supremacy rose and, and places were becoming segregated or unsafe to go to, mm -hmm. more people flocked to Economy Hall as a place for their entertainment and for their uh, school recitals and, and anything mm -hmm. that they had to do socially. So people came into Economy Hall um, and around the turn of the century, the, mu the new music, and we're talking about the turn of the 20th century, the new music that was coming up was the music of the streets. It was jazzy, right? The mm -hmm. way that, uh, Michael White told me it was like the hip hop. Hip hop was at the beginning, right? That right. people sort of shunned it. It's not, you know, we're used to hearing Philharmonic. That's what these guys would be saying. <laughs> but we're used to Philharmonic. We're used to opera, right? Well, the hip hop types, the jazz types started coming into the uh, economy society. And in fact, uh, one of the president's nephews, who was, uh, he was Mertil Piron, president of the economy society, uh, Armand Piron had a jazz band. So these mm -hmm. bands would start to play for the parties. Well, mm -hmm. the parties really supported the community because you would pay to get in, you would, uh, and you would pay the society members to get in and to rent the hall. The mm -hmm. cooks of the neighborhood would cook for the party, right? So, and the money would be raised for some philanthropic effort in the community. So the money stayed in the community and it increased. 
some of the people I began playing there was besides Armand Piron was uh, Kid Ori. Kid Ori hired Louis Armstrong one night. Uh, Louis Armstrong played and the people who owned a, a shipping uh, company, uh, they owned ships uh, and mm. that rode up and down the river and played music. They hired Louis Armstrong that night from Economy Hall. And that was his first time to go outside of the city. Mm. So he discovered an Economy Hall before he went right outside of the city. And that was in 1918 or 1919. I think it was 1919. Yeah. Uh, really quite, quite a, a, a nice enemy. And then eventually, of course, it, it, it deteriorated and eventually had to be ripped down, et cetera, et cetera, after having been around for over 100 years there. That's right. uh, your book is such a nice slice of, of New Orleans uh, history and, and also just informative about so many of the issues that took place that we're still dealing with um, and the ups and downs. And you, you mentioned just now about the meals and the parties that were had there. Um, I thought another part of your book from the ledgers was what they had eaten, what they, <laughs> what, what, what their parties were like uh, and how rich they were in the, when they got started in the 1830s and 40s and 50s as the economy was booming. And then, you know, how those meals uh, in the terrible times a couple of decades later were reduced to a ham sandwich or something like that. Right. Uh, that, was, that was another very nice little detail that gives you an insight as to what's going on in that group of people. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were drinking French wine. Uh, they were talking about the exquisite wine that they consumed right. in the very beginning. And near the end, it was around the time of the Depression. They had, uh, I think, they had beer and sandwiches or something, or soda yeah. and sandwiches. You know, so yeah. But and that, so the mighty have fallen, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, really, great slice of history, and uh, it was nice. Your 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 family involved in the whole process. I mean, you're. you're Finding the ledgers, the, the whole thing is a, is a great, a great tale. Almost like it is fiction, but it's not. So thank, you. thank you. Well, we really appreciate it. So uh, you're you're coming, uh, Fatima Sheikh, uh, and sharing your book, Economy Hall, which is right next to you uh, there on the shelf uh, for those who want to take a look for it and buy it. Um, and so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. <laughs>